Our second lightning round speaker this morning is going to talk to us about accessibility audits in academic libraries. Sounds like a very daunting thing, <laughs> but I'm sure you will make it uh, much more fun. Towering book stacks and heavy doors. Um, so Abby, go ahead and take it away. Uh, introduce yourself and tell us about how you're doing this at your library. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, my name is Avi Steam, and I am the Research and Scholarship Librarian uh, at Dakota State University. Um, RFT is around 2000 or so. Um, but yeah, recently we've been um, having a new look at the library in that we're trying to make it more accessible, um, acquire new furniture and stuff that just uh, makes it um, again, accessible for any and all students. So I also um, had performed uh, an accessibility audit during my time as a student at the University of Iowa, um, where I was uh, the president of the UI Students for Disability Advocacy and Awareness. So um, I have uh, that hands-on experience as well. And I just, Today, I will just be showing you some of some basic uh, stuff about accessibility and just some some tips and ideas to kind of get thinking about how you can make your own library uh, more accessible, even if you don't have um, the budget to do so. So to start off, uh, I want to go over the priorities for accessibility um, uh, named by the ADA. Uh, so this is basically uh, the stuff that you have to have um, according to the ADA. So as you can see, four main points, uh, accessible approach and entrance, access to goods and services, access to public toilet rooms, and access to other items such as water fountains. Um, so these are, uh, this is a good checklist um, just for a general approach um, to things. So um, just when you, whenever you look at a room or something in your library, just ask the question, you know, can people access this? Um, can, can, basically the question is, uh, can they get in? And if they can, can they uh, access whatever's inside, right? Um, but at the same time, it is pretty vague and it doesn't uh, really help um, it, in more specific areas, especially when uh, disabilities, especially when you get introduced into the broad range of disabilities, um, and especially when some disabilities uh, go against others in that, like, uh, for example, um, low sight people uh, or low vision People with uh, low vision, they might prefer brighter lights, while people with sensory issues might uh, prefer lower light lighting. Um, but to help with that, uh, we can look at the universal uh, design principles. Um, these can help us narrow down things. So the first one, equitable use. It, the, the design is useful to people with diverse disabilities. So um, think of that uh, small little ramp in the sidewalk. Um, people usually use it when they're uh, biking to get onto the sidewalk from the road. Um, this is uh, useful for people, um, whether you're walking, whether you're in a wheelchair, whether you have a stroller or a cart. Um, it's uh, useful to anyone and everyone. Uh, the next is flexibility in use. Uh, so it accommodates a wide range of preferences and abilities. Um, you can think of uh, like a dimming light switch where you can adjust the brightness of the lights. Uh, so if someone, uh, if the bright lights are too much, they're able to dim it. Um, but if they're not able to see, uh, they can um, up the brightness, you know. Um, it, it accommodates um, any uh, reason or ability in that case. Uh, low physical effort. Um, one main issue uh, when I was a student at the University of Iowa was that the doors to the library were super heavy. Um, <laughs> and so it took a bit of a extra, um, extra 
oomph to uh, get the door open. Um, and that can be exceptionally hard for people, uh, whether you're whether they have like mobility aids or if they're carrying a lot of things or if they just aren't that strong for whatever reason um, or they don't have all that good stand stamina um, that just makes it more difficult. So make sure uh, the design, it just has that low physical effort. You can just do it and not waste an extra breath on it. Um, simple intuitive use. So the design is easy to understand regardless of the user. Um, basically, like uh, say if you have a computer that um, patrons come in and use, but it needs um, to have all these certain buttons be hit in order for it to turn on in the first place, uh, that would not be really a simple intuitive use. Uh, so just think if can a patron just walk in and start using it and knowing how to use it on their own. Um, perceptible information, so the design communicates necessary information effectively to the user. So this one uh, can be, is very important for, to use with things like signage. Um, does the sign tell the patron what they need to know and does it do so accurately? Um, so the sign can say, this is the library, but if the sign is in a building across campus, um, that's not very effective, right? Uh, so making sure um, that it is able to communicate that information, but also do so accurately. So there's, um, that sign, for example, should be placed in the library and then it'd be <laughs> more accurate and effective. Um, so tolerance for error. So the design minimizes hazards and adverse consequences. My biggest uh, pet peeve is when I hit my hip on the sharp edge of tables. Um, oh, I have so that, many bruises from that. Yes. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. So much. And it <laughs> it's the smallest thing, but it hurts a lot. Um, and that can be even worse uh, for other for other individuals, depending on the disability, as well as even for kids, you know, um, a lot of uh, households, they'll um, put in the edge guards so that if their kid hits it by accident, they won't get um, hurt. Uh, so that's one of the things uh, you should look out for is just to make sure that if there are any uh, hazards possible that they're at the bare minimum. Um, and then size and space for approach and use. So a big issue with any library is book stacks, right? Um, <laughs> there's not, uh, that has been an ongoing conversation. I don't have a definitive answer to that. Um, you know, we all have a lot of bookshelves filled with a lot of books. Um, they're very tall or you either, where you have to stand on some stools in order to reach them or you have to bend down in order to grab them. Um, and there's very little space in between. Uh, ideally, you'd be able to uh, kind of open it up a bit, uh, add some more space in there so at least two people can be, um, be in the same uh, book stack aisle comfortably, right? Uh, but again, I understand that uh, physical space is very limited. So this is um, one that requires a lot of um, creativity uh, to think about. But um, so in my uh, experience, I've come across some uh, patterns and so, uh, here are some kind of helpful tips just to think about. Um, for example, uh, curves. Uh, arranging spaces in smooth curves instead of uh, like sharp edged boxes. Um, this is a uh, very helpful uh, just in creating uh, that extra space as well as minimizing hazards. Um, and then versatility. So getting furniture that allows patrons to transform the space to fit their needs. Uh, this is very um, one of the greatest 
uh, a great thing to get is like tables and chairs with wheels that way that they're light enough so that they're able to be moved to whichever part of the room um, and then you can redesign the room to fit whatever group of people are in that room for that time being um, and then you can easily put it away once again uh, also signage label everything <laughs> uh, it might come across to you you might think oh no this is uh this is uh into uh this is pretty basic like I, you'll get it um even if you think that label it anyways it's never it never hurts to have everything labeled and ideally you would also have label with braille at the bottom um but again that is uh that can be dependent on um your library and your budget um and services so placing the reference desk near the entrance and offering helpful items and services those items and services can be like noise canceling headphones uh lockers to store uh things um having a a book pickup option near the front door um this helps in uh, just uh, this helps in preventing a disabled person from having to struggle throughout the physical library building um, and only to find out that uh, they're not able to fit into the book stacks or they're not able to get access to this one book or to this room. Um, instead, they can have, uh, they'd be able to just go in and at the front and get the help they need right there um, at the center, at, at the door. Uh, and since I have a little extra time, I want to show you these pictures I found. Uh, these were designs created um, in this report um, published by the Library of Congress. Uh, it's in. It was from uh, 1989, so it's a bit outdated, but the designs are still very much applicable today. Um, as you can see here with the receptionist desk, it's right at the entrance and you can see the curve of the desk um, mm -hmm. and how that offers quite a bit of room, especially for wheelchair users. So they're able to turn around um, and uh, better uh, move themselves within that room. Um, so that's what I mean by uh, designing with curves instead of straight edge boxes. Uh, and here, the, there's a quite a quite a few ideas going on here. But um, so, for example, uh, doors uh, having power sliding doors, so that automatically opening doors. That's always um, great and fantastic uh, for bathroom doors. Uh, I know there's um, the maze design where you uh, walk in and then you go around a wall in, to enter the bathroom instead of actually opening a door. Um, all those are great accessible door designs. Um, having a change in the flooring to uh, define different areas, that's great, especially if you have a uh, especially for like um, young younger patrons for children um, you can uh, say here's the play area if you go outside onto the wood floor here you know you can't like run around anymore you have to kind of uh, be quiet and walk um, and uh, you see curved walls so that you're uh, you can feel your um, you're able to feel your way around it instead of heading straight into another wall. Um, handrails and um, my favorite part of it is the textured needlepoint artwork. Uh, we've all kind of, we've all had like a painting that we want to reach out and touch. I, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and they so generally the, say no don't touch <laughs> exactly no don't touch but having that artwork that is specifically designed so you can touch um that's just fun for everyone you know and for um people who are blind or low vision they'll be able to participate in it too um and that's just it, it's just a good reminder that this isn't doesn't have to be this um like a kind of monotone um dull thing to do you know you, you 
following regulations and everything, it can be fun and you can have end up with a very beautiful library um, by the end of it. Um, so here are some those resources I used um, in the accessibility audits, uh, the ADA checklist, um, uh, this one, the planning barriers for free libraries is where I got those, uh, those last two images and the universal design principles as well. So um, I'll send that to you so you can share it with everybody, but. So are those links in the slides, those are those are actual links to those documents yes, then? those are actual links. Yes, you have there, okay, perfect. Yeah, so that is all I have for you today. Oh, is that your last time? Okay. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, no problem. Let me awesome. Work all right, thank, yeah, thank you so much, Abby. Yeah, um, go ahead and leave that slide up there so people can see that, oh, that up there okay. for now while we do any questions. Um, so does anyone have any questions you want to ask of Abby? Anything? Um, more information you want to know about anything um has anyone done one of these kind of accessibility audits um i know audit is such a scary word for some people <laughs> um but it's not that kind of audit you don't get in trouble uh well there is the ada that you do need to be uh, you know depending on you know your public space right <laughs> things available yeah um uh, we did have a question about the resources yeah so these resources mm -hmm. i wanted to know resources basically how do you, you know, if you you are a staff person and you know this is something important, do you have any, and you, know, you said you had done this, they want to know, do you have any tips for convincing admin or people in charge that this is something that needs to have um, effort, money, whatever put into? Um, I know you said you had done this before, mm -hmm. so is that how you, you know, convince them saying, I've done this and I know we should, or do you have any tips for people on how to... Make yeah. The case. yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I've been lucky in that the people I've worked with have already been uh like wanting to um be uh, more accessible and just above ADA compliancy. So I've been lucky in that. Um, but uh, yeah, that is hard depending on the person, you know. Um, but if if you have these checklists and these um, mark offs on what to do um, and then just coming up with your own ideas and having something to bring to the table so it doesn't seem like, oh, that's a lot of extra work we need to do. Instead, it's like, no, the work is done. It's right here, you know. Um, for example, if you're getting new bookshelves and you want to make them more accessible, uh, go ahead and like research and find um, bookshelves that would be uh, ideal ideal for your library and also accessible, you know, uh, just kind of as you're going through um, it, sorry, um, but as you're going uh, through uh, working on how to propose, it, propose this stuff to admin, uh, just uh, really just, um, have the have those ideas up already and, and have say, those checklists just, saying look we've mm -hmm. already done some things it's already here but right could be better there's all these boxes we haven't checked right exactly um, we're okay but we could be better <laughs> exactly um, and there's someone actually a comment here that just came through is a great comment. Um, mm -hmm. Having had a coworker who was wheelchair bound, I am much more conscious conscious of accessibility. Um, and like you mentioned, narrow space between bookshelves is a huge pet peeve. I mean, yeah. even as a non, you know, someone who doesn't need have any issues with that, sometimes those um, aisles are just way too close for comfort. And I mm -hmm. oftentimes will stop and go around a different way if I, unless I absolutely have to go down that particular aisle. But you definitely need to, All right. yeah. And then you, you can't issue. access those books, and so it's like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that one that one is a bit tricky because uh, it's just um, not everyone can do uh, can say, oh, we have a digital library, we can build up the digital library because not all patrons have access to the digital library either. True. True. Um, especially with you know our small uh, small town libraries, uh, 
a lot of pat uh, patrons are in rural areas and they might not have internet access or solid internet access. So, um, again, that's just, uh, a lot of this is just really brainstorming um, and uh, finding, <laughs> finding like that perfect furniture as well and just moving your, what you have around a little bit, it can just be the placement of uh, a chair, you know, placing it in a different corner to make um, mm -hmm. some more open room. That can make a world of difference. Um, yeah. Um, so we do have another question. I think this will be the last one we'll take now because we do have to get onto our last um, lightning round speaker. Um, sure. Someone says, I work in an academic library as well. Oftentimes the ADA compliance is an afterthought for our designers and administration. Yeah, sad that designers, I mean, I get admin might be not aware, but you think someone designing or in construction would, yeah. Um, but for example, we had all new light fixtures put in and they are extremely bright and there's no dimmer switches. Ugh. Um, so I guess it's the same kind of question that the previous person had. Suggestions and tips for having conversation with administrators are not always conscientious of this and other similar ADA issues. Um, do you think in some cases it's more of a, do we need to, I don't mean to be rude about it, throw the legality of it at them? I mean, legally you need to be doing certain things and you're if you don't, yeah. depending on who you have coming into your building, you could have a, a lawsuit or some PR that you just don't want. <laughs> right, and it's, that is definitely, uh, it, sometimes it will have to come down to that where you do have to bring up the ADA and um, say you gotta do something about this. Yeah. Um, and uh, honestly, they they should have they should have already thought of it beforehand. It shouldn't have been an afterthought. So that is ultimately um, not to <laughs> not to place blame, but it is ultimately on them uh, mm -hmm. if they have to redo everything. Yeah. Um, but uh, for so it, yeah, and that can that can always be tough and definitely intimidating. So I also recommend um, having people uh, go with you or be with you when you present this information. Mm -hmm. um, and also uh, too, don't be afraid to reach out to like student groups as well, because mm -hmm. students are also very much a part of the library and are very much using it. So um, if they um, are definitely bothered, you know, by the light switches as well, because I, I know in my libraries, um, quite a few students are very bothered by how bright the lights are can be. Um, so just bringing them along as well to kind of have that extra uh, push that it's um, it, it's a pretty These are the big people thing. you built the space for and they're not happy. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Abby. This is great. Very useful. And I got some comments coming. This was great. Thank you. Totally, uh, totally awesome presentation. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Great. Thank you so much.